David R. here. Today, I'm going to talk to you about this book, Fahrenheit 451 by Ray Bradbury. This book is about a character named Guy Montag. He is a fireman, but he doesn't put out fires. He starts them. His job is to burn books. He's like the censorship police. Even though today the censors burn digital information by deleting it or unpersoning someone from the internet, Guy Montag burnt the actual physical book like these here. And he enjoyed his job. In the opening page of the book, It was a pleasure to burn. It was a special pleasure to see things eaten, to see things blackened and changed with the brass nozzle in his fist, with the great python spitting his venomous kerosene upon the world. The blood pounded in his head, and his hands were the hands of some amazing conductor playing all the symphonies of blazing and burning to bring down the tatters and charcoal ruins of history. Burning history. It's kind of like what Winston was doing in the book 1984. He was deleting and burning history. And that's what Montag is doing. Shortly after work one night, Montag meets a young girl. I think she's like 17. Her name is Clarice And she just happened to be walking while Montag was walking home. They met and they started talking. And she said, didn't firefighters used to put out fires in the past? He's like, no, no, no. Firefighters have always started fires. Because that's all he knows. He had not investigated this yet. She asked him, she said... Are you happy? And before he could answer, she was already gone. She ran away. So this makes him think, am I happy? He's like, sure, I'm happy. But he's really not underneath it all. And up to this point, before he met Clarice, he had not investigated himself internally. And after that meeting with her, he started to you know, examine himself inward. And he started to find out quite a few things. And when he got home, he discovered that his wife, Mildred, had overdosed on sleeping pills. And so he calls the emergency line, asked for somebody to come over and help her. They came over. They basically withdrew her old blood and put in new blood and uh, and serum. And this revived her. And they said, well, we do this all the time. It's not a big deal. They really didn't make a big deal of it. It was nothing. You know, happens all the time. People OD on drugs constantly. And so... They fixed her up. The next day, she woke up. She didn't even remember it. Either she didn't remember it or she didn't want to remember it because she didn't care. I mean, these people in this book, most of them, are spiritually hollow. They are empty vessels walking around uh, asleep, essentially. And his wife is definitely one of them. She's overly entertained just like the rest of the the world so montag sees clarice again this time she has a dandelion and she rubs it under her chin and then she says well if if the um yellow stuff from the dandelion disappears then you're in love So she rubs it under Montag's and the yellow stuff from the dandelion stays there. It doesn't go away. 
So this supposedly means that he's not in love. He's like, what do you mean? I love my wife. But really, underneath it all, he, he kind of doesn't. At the fire station the next day, Montag is attacked by the mechanical hound. It's more like a spider, I think. It had eight legs, and it uh, had a four-inch needle that would stick into its victim. The needle contained morphine or procaine. This hound didn't like Montag. Apparently, it was suspecting that Montag was hiding something. And yes, Montag was hiding a lot of things. During a card game at the firehouse, Montag asked BT, his chief, his fire chief, if firefighters always started fires. BT told him to read the Firemen of America rule book, and in it, it said, established 1790 to burn English-influenced books in the colonies. Fireman, Benjamin Franklin. There were five rules that the firemen had to obey. One was answer alarm swiftly. Two, start fire swiftly. Three, burn everything. Four, report back to the firehouse. Five, stand alert for other alarms. From this point on, BT suspected that Montag was hiding something, perhaps hoarding books. And as you know, books are illegal in this world. One particular incident causes a major disruption in Montag's life. It's when they go to an older woman's house and she has a library, a giant library of books. This would be ideal for anybody that loves books, I think, because it's isolated and you have books everywhere. Uh, to me, this would be perfect. So the woman, instead of allowing the men to burn up her books, she kneels down and lights the match because there's, there's kerosene already on the books. The firefighters are getting ready to burn. She does the burning because she says, you can't ever have my books. So you see, there's something in the books, something of value that Montag starts to see. He's like, what is it though? I mean, what is it about these books that people are willing to die for? That night he learned that Clarice had been run over by somebody and she had died. He didn't see her, but he had heard that. And he asked his wife, where and when did we meet? She couldn't answer that question. She didn't remember. And I'm thinking, I don't... I don't even know if Montag even remembers. He's just asking her because he can't remember. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that's, that's a question that she can't answer. She doesn't know or doesn't care. She's always entertained by the parlor walls. These are full full screen TVs. They're, they're, they cover a whole wall. And she's always watching entertaining shows. She's communicating with people in there. In a way, it's like a TV webcam. And if she's not on the TV or the parlor walls, she has a seashell radio of some kind. It fits over their ear. Uh, everybody's got these. They're, they're seashells. And they can listen to things on the radio, too. He was having flashbacks of the woman burning with her books. He said, we burnt an old woman with her books. We burnt a thousand books. We burnt copies of Dante and Swift and Marcus Aurelius. There must be something in books that we can't imagine to make a woman stay in a burning house. There must be something there. You don't stay for nothing. After thinking about this the whole night, Montag is ill the next day. The smell of kerosene makes him vomit. So he wanted Mildred to call in sick for him, but she didn't do it. And she heard something outside the door, and she's like, oh, it was just a dog. Really, it was a mechanical hound spying on Montag. He didn't know it, but 
Soon after the mechanical hound left, his boss showed up. BT explained to Montag how society got to where it was at that point. He said it was a process of truncation or shortening of entertainment. I'm going to read some things from the book now just to give you a description of what he's talking about. Classics cut to fit, 15-minute radio shows, then cut again to fill a two-minute book column, winding up at last as a 10- or 12-line dictionary resume. I exaggerate, of course. The dictionaries were for reference. But many were those whose sole knowledge of Hamlet, you know the title certainly, Montag, it is probably only a faint rumor of a title to you, Miss Montag, whose sole knowledge, as I say, of Hamlet was a one-page digest in a book that claimed, Now, at last, you can read all the classics. Keep up with your neighbors. Do you see? Out of the nursery, into the college, and back to the nursery. There's your intellectual pattern for the past five centuries or more. He goes on, speed up the film, Montag, quick, click, pick, look, I, now, flick, here, there, swift, pace, up, down, in, out, why, how, who, what, where, eh, huh, uh, bang, smack, wallop, bing, bong, boom. And he goes on from there. But you see, everything is shortened. It's like uh, Twitter. Everything is shortened. And memes, they're all short. Uh, sure, they get their point across, but they're, they're short. They, there's nothing to read there except maybe a line or, or word or maybe not even that much. BT went on to say that we must all be alike, not born free and equal, but made equal. Each person is made in the image of the other, not God. Then everyone is happy. You see, in communist countries, they don't allow God to be part of the discussion. And I'm assuming that that's what this world is. It's totalitarian. It's uh, communist. Burning books keeps people from being sad. Beatty said, there was no need for firemen for the old purposes. They were given the new job as custodians of our peace of mind. So you see, firemen were there to make everybody happy, to keep the status quo, to keep people from thinking, so that if they're not reading, they're being entertained by the parlor walls or the seashell radio. They're not thinking, so they're no threat to the government. And he went on to say that books say nothing. They're about non-existent people Figments of imagination, if they're fiction, and if they're non-fiction, there's just <laughs> scholars arguing with each other, telling each other that they're stupid. Montag asked a question, which gets him into trouble later. Is He said, what if a fireman happened to take a book with him, take it home? And BT said that it's just the natural order of things, but Montag had a lot of books. And at the same time, though, this makes BT question whether Montag actually has more books or what's on Montag's mind. Because, you know, in this world, you're not supposed to think for yourself. You're supposed to have others do that for you. Eventually, Montag meets up with a man that he only met once. His name was Faber. And... Faber and Montag talk, and Montag says that he has all these questions that need answered, all these frustrations, and he finds out a lot about Faber. Faber is a rebel, just like him, and Faber has this little electronic earpiece. It's called the Green Bullet. He puts it in Montag's ear so he can talk with him while Montag is out doing whatever he's doing. And, uh, you know, they want to disrupt the status quo. They want to make people think. They want books disseminated 
throughout the land. You know, they're rebels. And so uh, when Montag returned home after meeting with Faber, he finds that his wife is entertaining guests, and he doesn't like her friends. Her friends are shallow. They are just like her, essentially. They have no soul. They are superficial. And so he gets irritated with them, so he decides to read uh, a couple passages from Dover Beach by Matthew Arnold. I'll, I'll give you a sample of it. The sea of faith was once, too, at the full and round earth's shore. Lay like the folds of a bright girdle furled. But now I only hear its melancholy, long, withdrawing roar, retreating to the breath of the night wind down the vast edges drear and naked shingles of the world. And after some words, Montag uh, insults these women. They run out of the house, screaming, crying. They're very, very upset with him. Back at the firehouse the next day, Montag is baited by BT. BT quotes literature and he tries to get Montag upset and it works because at some point he grabs Montag's wrist and finds that Montag's pulse is racing and he is like, ah, I've got you now. I've got you fired up. And he did even though Montag wasn't showing it externally. It was going on internally. That night, they had a special case. Normally, BT doesn't drive, but he did this time. BT said, here we go to keep the world happy, Montag. And they pull up right in front of Montag's house. Yeah. At Montag's house, BT says, well, now you did it. Old Montag wanted to fly near the sun, and now that he's burnt his wings, he wonders why. Didn't I hint enough when I sent the hound around your place? See, he sent the hound earlier. And Montag also found out that his wife and, and her friends betrayed him, and so uh, that bothers him a lot. Faber tries to tell Montag to run away, but Montag decides to pick up the flamethrower and torch his place himself. And he enjoys it. And then there's a confrontation between Montag and BT. The earplug falls out. It gets broken. Montag kills BT. And then he blows up the mechanical hound soon after that. And then he's on the run. And the first place he goes to is a fireman's house. He plants some books there so that that fireman can be arrested. And then he nearly gets run over by some children, children of all ages. I guess there's some adults in there. And he's nearly run over because people in this world, they speed for fun. You know, they're, they're so entertained. They have to be entertained by everything. And they speed really fast through town. And his wife had done the same as well. Just speeding really fast. And he wonders, maybe Clarice had died this way. Maybe she was just run over by some teenagers or kids just speeding through town. So Montag goes to Faber's house. He tells him what happened. He's like, you know, BT's dead. Mechanical Hound is blown up. Mildred's gone. The house is all burned. He lost his job. And so uh, Faber shows Montag the television. And it, it uh, gives Montag an idea as to what's going on out there, even though he's not currently outside. But there is a mechanical hound and a helicopter chasing after who is supposed to be Montag, but it's not Montag. It's somebody else, some unfortunate person. They're, they're chasing him, and uh, you know Montag figures, well, he has to get out of there before they actually find him, the real Montag. And so he goes on the run, and he floats down a river, 
and then finds some railroad tracks where he meets up with other people who are probably on the run or they're rebels or people that like to read. He meets a guy named Granger and Granger tells him about himself and the group and they already know who Montag is because they've seen him on TV. And then Granger takes him in and shows him a screen and he says, this is the conclusion to you being on the run. So there was some unfortunate person who happened to be out walking her dog. That person got accused of being Montag, runs away. Eventually that person is killed. And so uh, they claim that, well, it's all been taken care of, everybody. You can go back to your houses and back to your normal routine because the, the uh, criminal has been extinguished. And so Montag meets several people who have memorized books. They have photographic memories. Like one person is referred to as this book. One person is referred to as that book or whatever book that may be. They are referred to as, as that book. So uh, this keeps the books alive. And so war planes come in and bomb the city. They vaporize it, turn it to dust. Montag thinks, well, I wonder what my wife was doing, Mildred. I wonder what she was doing before the planes came. But there's nothing he could do about it because everybody was dead, except for him and those people who were outside of the city. They didn't have that problem. So he quotes something from Revelation, and this is how the book ends. It says, And on either side of the river there was a tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And essentially, that's what was going to happen in this new world now that the old one was destroyed, there would be healing, healing of the nations, healing so that uh, people can go back to being free instead of being under this communist system that they were in. Now, this book was published in 1953. There were three sections to it. And the title of the book, Fahrenheit 451, is the temperature that a book catches fire and burns. Now, there have been other film adaptations to this book, some recent, some old. I, I like the film adaptation from 1966. That's my favorite. I've seen some others. Uh, they're okay. But I, I don't know. I just like the 1966 version a little more. Well, anyway, that's all I got. Talk to you later. Bye.